So this will last as long as my voice lasts. I am recovering from a cold. My voice was great yesterday. It's not great today. So Lex was very kind. He brought me some candies to chew on. I've got a bottle of water. We'll just keep going until it won't last any longer. Um, it's important for you to understand <coughs> where the background came from for this presentation. I've been in five startups in the last 15 years, and four of those, the last four, have all been in Maryland. Um, and three of them received investment money from TEDCO. TEDCO is the Technology Development Corporation for Maryland. And it's a seed fund. It's a state-funded seed fund. And for the last three years, um, I've served on their board of reviewers, where we get to review the submissions, the business plan submissions. And as a board, we vote on funding or not funding those submissions. So we do. Uh, we review about three to six business plans a month. And so we see about 50, um, I would guess, throughout the year. So after doing that for a year and a half, it became very obvious that it was very difficult to fund some of these submissions because most of the people are technologists or they're people with great ideas but no idea how to convince an investor that they're worth investing in. So I put this together with the help of some people from TEDCO. And now, <coughs> in Maryland, we take this presentation around to the incubators and try and help the startups understand what it takes to get money from investors. And so this is actually a three-hour-long boot camp and it talks a lot about how to find investors, uh, how to improve your chances. And one of the key items is the pro forma income statement. So what? after this is over, you're all going to get a copy of the whole presentation, the whole 55, 60 slides, whatever it is. But for the purposes here, I'm just going to race through the first few until we get to the pro forma section. <clears throat> then we'll f excuse me, focus on the pro forma, and then we'll wrap it up. But if you want me to go back over any of the issues with finding VCs or the behavior of VCs or angel investors, I'd be happy to do that. But first and foremost, we need to get through the pro f at least the pro forma section. So it's a long shot. If you want to get into your own startup business, the Wikipedia estimates one in 400 get funded. Um, about 4,000 startups get funded each year by VCs and angel investors. And so 1.6 million fail to raise money. So after you graduate from university and you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to get started, as a startup business, it's really, really difficult. My personal experience is don't do it, because it'll drive you crazy. You'll be bankrupt. Your spouse will leave you. Your children won't have an education fund. Your mortgage will be maxed out. You'll lose your home, your credit cards. Right? So if you still want to do it, then you're a true entrepreneur. But it's not easy, right? I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. Investment sources. You can go out looking for money, friends and family, grants, strategic investors, venture funds, angels, philanthropic foundations, angel philanthropists, private placement, crowdfunding. Many places to go and look for money. Um, when I present this to TED co audiences, we focus on VCs and angels. <clears throat> and the thing you need to remember if ever you're pitching to an investor, they are investors. They're not there just because they're nice and they want to see somebody succeed. They only care about making money, right? 
So investors invest because they want to make a return on their money, not just because you've got a cool idea. VC, venture capital, this is a lot of material, but just to summarize it, VCs don't invest their own money. VCs collect money from rich pension funds, insurance companies, family funds, foundations, etc. They pool that money and then they invest in startup businesses with the intent of giving these people that gave them the money a big return on their money. So VCs, it's not their money, it's other people's money. If they don't invest it wisely and make a, a decent return for the people that gave them the money in the first place, then they're fired, right? They're not out there to be nice people. Good news this year, nearly $50 billion of venture investment in 2014. Best year since 2000, which was huge. <coughs> New Enterprise Associates, the largest VC fund in the world, probably, are just starting their 15th fund. They're trying to raise $2.5 billion from their investors, and then they take that $2.5 billion and invest it in people like you. But as I said, it's a competition. Only 4,000 companies get this money each year. You've got to be good. It doesn't matter how good your idea is, it depends on how rich they think you can make them, right? The downside of this is that locally, I, had, I don't have the fourth quarter of 2014 numbers, but up until the third quarter, only 1.5% of that money is coming to this local area. If you move to California, anywhere west of the Mississippi, <coughs> you'll stand a much better chance of getting funded. Boston, California, and New York are the hot areas for money. Uh, angels, angels invest their personal money. Angel investors have usually made money from their own venture. They want to multiply that money, so they'll often invest their own personal funds in you. Angels will, inv will invest earlier than venture funds, but they take a much higher risk. Ted Coe, as I said, is a seed fund, which is a little bit like angel investing. If you want an angel's money, you've got to be able to demonstrate that you're going to succeed because they're taking a much higher risk. So what do they want to know? If you ever get to present to a serious investor, it's not about your mousetrap. They're not too interested in your technology. They're interested in, can you run a business? Can you make money? Are you going to make them more money than the other choice they had? VCs and angels get hundreds of business plans a month to look at. They have to screen them out quickly, and then they have to make a choice who they're going to invest in. This is about your plan to make them rich. It's about your team's ability to run a business. Can you take input? Can you pivot? Are you making good assumptions? So they will assess your business ability. They'll, they'll get someone else to assess your technology. I was in the telecom industry for 25 years. I would get calls from VCs asking me, is this a good technology? Is there a market for it, et cetera, et cetera. They'll find other experts to assess the technology, but they'll assess you personally and whether you can make them rich. So when they're looking at you, their priorities are the team, Next, the idea, is it a growing market? Are there barriers to entry? What's the potential ex exit? How will they make money? Can the team deliver the business model? We'll skip that. When you've got a business plan together or when you've got your idea together, 
and someone asks, an investor asks you to see your idea, you'll never have the right document to give them. Someone will ask you for an executive summary. Someone will ask you for a short form business plan. Others will ask you for a full business plan. Others will want a 10 minute pitch. Others will want a 45 minute PowerPoint pitch. You'll never have the right document. You'll never have the right material. So try and do all of them. And then you've got to condense it into a 30 second elevator pitch. If you ever meet a potential investor at a networking event, you've roughly got 30 seconds to get their attention. And in that 30 seconds, you should not spend more than 10 seconds talking about what your idea is. The other 20 should be talking about how you're going to make them rich. So you're getting the message here, right? All they want to know is, what will you do with my money, and how will it make me rich? That's all they want to know. If you ask them this question, they'll deny it. But I know a bunch of investors personally, and I ask them if this is always on top of their mind, and they said yes, but they'd never ever say it to you, right? So this is what's on their mind when you're trying to pitch to them. And the pro forma income statement, which is what we're going to talk about now, is the one page of information that that investor will look at to assess if you know what you're doing and you know how a business is built and you know how to make money. And so <clears throat> we're going to spend most of the time now talking about how you construct a pro forma income statement. And don't get confused by the words, a pro forma income statement means it's a guess. It's a guess at what you think your business is going to look like. It's got nothing to do with financial rules. It's got nothing to do with SEC regulations. It's got nothing to do with CPAs. In fact, if you asked a CPA to put a pro forma together, their head would explode because it follows no rules. It's just simple arithmetic. You don't have to be a a whiz kid to put a pro forma together. But if the pro forma doesn't answer their question about what you will you do with my money and how will it make me rich, it's a red flag to them. So here's why we put this material together, because we would get companies coming in and pitching at TEDCO. Everything would look great except the one chart they were asked to present about their pro forma. It was usually really bad. And <clears throat> I'll explain as we go through this what errors are typically made. So how to build a pro forma. So if you're building a product or, a, or you're delivering a service, it takes you a while to develop that product. It takes you a while to establish the service. So whatever it is, that you're going to be selling, first thing you should do is start with the product development timeline. This is not the way you write a business plan. This is not the way you put your pitch together. But this is how you build a pro forma. You start with the timeline of the product or service you're developing. Because one thing that often happens is we see revenue numbers appearing on pro formas before they've finished developing the product or service. So if you're going to have revenues in year two, but the product's not ready till year three, stupid, right? But people actually do this. So start with the timeline. When will the beta product be ready? When you will you have release one features ready for market? sometimes called the minimum viable product or service. When will you have release two of the product available? What will be the price of the release one product? What will be the price of the release two product? Is there going to be a difference? Can you charge more for release two product? How many people are you going to be hiring to develop this product or service? And 
how much you're going to be paying those people. And then when you're going to begin marketing the product, <coughs> six, six months before the first sale, three months before the first sale, how much are you going to spend on marketing and advertising? When are you going to add sales resources? Do you need a sales team? And how much sales expense is it going to cost to create revenues? And do all these numbers increase as you m increase revenues? So if you claim that you're going to be increasing revenues at a certain rate per year, are the marketing and sales expenses going up with the revenue numbers? It's all got to link together. And the one thing we always see, for instance, we had one business plan where the revenues are growing every year, but the rent they were paying for their building stayed the same. They were growing the number of people, but they were still only r renting the same office space that they had when they started. And dis disconnects like that <coughs> make investors scared that you're not paying attention to the small details. So. Here's what a pro forma income statement looks like. It's seven lines of sales, cost of sales, gross margin, gross margin percentage, SG&A, R&D, and operating and earnings. And I'm going to explain every line so you know what to put on each line. It's a forecast. It reflects your plans. It reflects your assumptions. It's a test of consistency, and it's not meant to meet accounting rules. And it's your best estimate. And when you present this to a potential investor, they'll always try and pick it apart and tell you you're wrong. And they're testing you to see how well you defend your assumptions. So when you present to an investor, and they start criticizing this, they're testing you. They don't know the answer any better than you do. But they expect you to stand up and fight for your assumptions. That's what a pro forma income statement strictly is. But because investors want to know what you're doing with their cash, they also need to know a few other things. Like how much capital spending are you going to have to make? How much investment money do you want from them? And how much cash on hand will you have at the end of each year? And those extra lines will become obvious as we talk about these lines one at a time. So let's start with the first line. Let's talk about sales. So it's the most important line in the whole pro forma. If there are no sales, there's no business. That's kind of obvious. But they want to know where those sales are coming from, how you intend to get those sales. So sales, uh, sales of product and services, it can include licensing income, royalty payments to you. It can include, sorry, and it cannot include grants and investments. So the sales line is purely the sales of everything you're producing that somebody's paying for. Grants and investments are something that technically go on a balance sheet, but they don't go in the sales line. A lot of people come in and put SBIR grants on their research grants. No, it's sales of products and services. So how did you come up with those numbers? And I'm sorry to have to tell you that you cannot just pick a percentage of market share out of thin air <coughs> and put that on your sales line. So if you've done a wonderful analysis of the market size, who spends how much money every year on your product or service, you cannot go in and say, I'm going to win half a percent market share on year one. 2% market share in year two, X, you know, and so on. 
That's called top-down sales. Top-down sales doesn't fly with investors. You've got to come in with bottom-up numbers. By bottom-up, it means you have to build um, a revenue line that's based on which accounts are you going to have to go after first, which, which market community are you going to attack first, how many salespeople does it need to win a dollar of revenue in that market. Most importantly, they want to know how you're going to get the first sale. And the issue we always run into here is that let's say $100 million a year is spent in the market you're addressing. Just because you bring a product into that market doesn't mean the market size goes up by $10 million. People still have a budget to work to. Everybody in this room lives on a budget, right? So just because a new TV is available on the market or a new laptop or a new something, you don't suddenly have more money in your budget to go out and buy that nice thing. You still have to live to a budget. A corporation lives on a budget. A corporation, before I was in a startup, I, I worked for Nortel for 25 years. I ran a billion dollar revenue division. My R&D budget was $140 million a year. If a customer said, I want this feature, build it for me. I didn't suddenly get a $150 million R&D budget. I still could only spend $140 million on R&D. So you have to make some decisions when you're in a corporation. What are you actually going to spend your R&D money on? Because you don't suddenly get more money. You get more money after you've earned the revenue. Same with sales. People who are buying your product they're not just going to buy it because they like it. You have to display something they've already budgeted for. So this will be the number one quiz you get. Everything after the sales line is easy to defend in front of investors, but your sales revenue line is the hardest set of numbers you will have to defend. And if you defend it by market share numbers, you're on a loser right from day one, right? So if you're going to spend any time on anything at all, spend it on this line. My question? Sorry? Which one? Hmm? The first sale? Uh, going back, that sales line, the top line on the pro forma, OK? So. How will you get the first sale? Beta customers, reference accounts, that's always a good answer. So if you've got a product and you need to test it in the market, go and find a beta customer, somebody that you give the product to free of charge for testing. Use them as a reference, and they'll connect you to their friends who will buy the product from you. So that's always a good answer. I'm not cheating here, but. It's a good start, right? And then how will you grow annually? And how did you set your price? You know, you've got to be able to justify the price you're charging for this. OK, so I'm going to make up some numbers and fill in that top line. I just put some numbers in here just so you can see the end result. Next line is cost of sales. Cost of sales is how much it costs you to manufacture, deliver, install, whatever product or service you're in. How much did it cost you to deliver that? It can include warranty provisions. It can in, it's got to include the cost of goods you sold, not sold, but are obsolete. So anything you make and you have to throw it away, because you made it badly, or the customer didn't like it, and you had failures in your product, and you had to take the product back and ship them another one. All those costs go onto this line. The problem we find with a lot of startup businesses, they make too much of the product. 
thinking they're going to get the sale. And then they find that there's a, a fault in the product that they didn't know about. And everything they made ahead of time, they have to scrap because they have to make new ones now because they never detected the fault. So all those scrapped items go into this cost of sales line. So do you understand your costs? And here's an important one. You will have to incur the costs well ahead of being paid for the product. So when somebody gives you an order, let's say you're really lucky and right on day one you get an order for $10 million worth of your product or service. You don't get paid when you get the order. You get paid, if you're lucky, you get paid 90 days after you delivered the product. So you may get an order on day one. You then have to figure out how to pay for making that product. And then on day 30, you ship it. And then on day 90, you get paid for it. So you've got four months of having to pay for all this before anyone pays you a dollar. So when you're talking about raising money, don't assume you're going to get paid on the day you deliver it or the day you get the order. There's a huge time lag. So I put some numbers in for my cost of sales. So what I'm saying here is I have no sales in year one. 200,000 here and a cost of 150. 3 million of sales and cost of 2 million. So that allows us now to calculate the gross margin. And the gross margin is just dollar sales minus cost of sales equals dollar margin. <coughs> so if I go back here, I've got $50,000 of margin, a million dollars of margin, $3 million of margin. It's that simple. If you want to calculate it as a percentage, then it's dollars margin divided by dollar sales times 100. So, oops. So 50 on 200 is a 25% gross margin. It's that easy. But it's important you calculate the gross margin dollars because that's a benchmark. They'll compare you to other industries using those numbers. Margins change over time. Competition drives prices down. Premium features can raise your price. Costs can drop if you make more. And costs can rise if you have product reliability issues. So margins should never stay constant. If you put a pro forma together, and the margin line always shows a 30% margin from <clears throat> year one to year five. It's not real. So going back to this calculation, we start off with a 25% margin, and we end up here with a 53% margin. Again, I'm just putting numbers in for the fun of it to see what it ends up like. Next line, SG&A, selling general and admin. This is everything you spend except the research and development department. Salaries and benefits of everyone but the R&D team. Trade shows, advertising, marketing, <coughs> rent, laptops, phone, legal, bank charges. Everything your business spends except development of the product or service. Is your spending on sales and marketing consistent with revenue growth? As soon as you launch your product or service, the competition's going to try and derail you. Anyone in the market before you will consider you're a threat. They'll try and put you out of business by outspending you on sales and marketing. So don't pretend you can launch a product and then just sit back and watch it sell, because everyone else out there is trying to stop you from being successful. And that's something I don't think startups realize. Every competitor out there is going to try and make you fail. As soon as you come out with a product, it doesn't matter if you're Apple and Samsung. They're always trying to 
defeat the other guys. Quality of his phone, quality of the service, quality of the camera. They're always trying to derail each other. And that will happen to you. So again, I plugged in some numbers on this line. Research and development is the next line. This is the salaries and benefits of your R&D team. Whoever's developing the product, whoever's adding features, whoever's working on keeping you ahead of the competition. It can include lab tools, and it can include contractors. But this is what it's taking to fund development of your product. And they will want to know, is, you, so, sorry, is your R&D spend consistent with new features required to stay ahead of competition and sell at a competitive price? Because as soon as you launch a product, especially if it's a piece of hardware, you're going to have to reduce the cost of that product. If you introduce a service, to deliver that service, you've got to reduce your cost. Even if you're just selling sandwiches, somebody is going to try and beat you on price. So you're going to have to reduce the cost of the sandwich somehow. You know, thinner slices of bread, less meat. Or you go for a better, bigger sandwich that people appreciate because you're giving them better value for money. But you can't just sit on your laurels with the initial product. You've got to keep improving it and keeping ahead of the competition. So here, I put in an R&D line, again, guesswork. But now all you need to do is calculate operating earnings. And operating earnings is just this line, gross margin, minus this, minus this. And that's how much money you've got left, right? So the gross margin up here, this million dollars, is what has to pay for this $1.8 million here. So obviously, you're spending more than you're making in margin. That's normal for an early stage business. So if we fill in operating earnings, as I said, it's gross margin minus SGNA and R&D. Operating margin is that number divided by sales times 100 to get it as a percentage. Typical errors. We see people with huge margins, insufficient spending to stay ahead of the market and stay ahead of the competition. Rapid revenue growth, you know, even though they say they're being conservative, there's only a certain speed at which you can grow your revenues. And some of them claim better earnings than any large corporation. And I'm going to illustrate that. So here, operating earnings are negative, negative, negative. Start going positive. Pretty good. Don't worry about negative margins as a percentage. Don't worry. Don't even calculate it. So here we've got 13% <coughs> operating margin and 16. So now, you have to go and compare this with real life businesses. So these are numbers from Apple, Pfizer, Facebook, and General Motors. And you can find these on Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance, you can see the, the real-time P&L, the real-time balance sheet, the real-time cash flow of any company that's listed. We see a lot of companies that have better gross margins than Apple and better operating margins than Apple and they're producing some, something similar, right? If you're in the social networking, we see companies coming in and pr predicting they're going to get better gross margins than Facebook and better operating margins than Facebook. That's a killer. No investor is going to believe you if you're going to try and tell them that your business is going to create more cash than Apple going to create better margins than Facebook. So I don't know what business you're thinking of getting into, but try and find a comparable publicly traded company 
with a similar type of service, a similar type of product. And what you'll find is they all have a similar model. Yeah, go ahead. It seems like kind of you had <coughs> started at the beginning by saying we shouldn't do a top-down strategy. We shouldn't say we're going to capture this percentage of the market share and figure out our costs based on that. And then you're also telling us that we should make sure that when the numbers put out a percentage of our operating margin, that it should be reasonable compared to these competitors. So it seems like you're also telling us, in addition to the bottom-up strategy, that we should do a version of the top-down strategy, starting with what our competitors are yes. doing and yes. making sure yes. that all of the other numbers make yes. sense to them. Yes, you're right. So bottom-up sales numbers and plug the rest of the numbers to try and match the industry you're in, so right? And by, and by the word plug, I mean copy, right? So that's why a CPA, the head would explode if you ask them to do this. So I came out of the telecom industry. Um, I, I was with Nortel back when we had a telecom industry in this country. My competition was Lucent, Alcatel, um, Cisco, a few other companies. What you find is every industry settles on a model that looks very similar between company and company. I, I, had, a, an R and, I had a revenue number, and then my R&D number had to be 14% of my revenue number. And if you looked at all of Nortel's different divisions, and then you looked at Lucent and Alcatel, we were all spending 14% roughly on R&D. When you looked at SG&A, we were all spending 22% of our revenue on SG&A. So I had to make a 36% margin, 14 plus 22. I had to make a 36% margin for my business to break even. And so when invest, when the professional investment community, stockbrokers, look at Apple. Every time Apple announces results, they all quibble about how many percentage points Apple has gone down or up on gross margin. Because they know that for that industry, if Apple's not making 36 and higher, they're going to be in trouble. So. Yes, by all means, pick your industry and copy those numbers, right? So you just said this, but I want to emphasize it. These, are these, these companies and these uh, ratios, these margins are in a, a, in a somewhat steady state, right? These are, these are fairly mature companies. Your first few years are not going to look like this. You're going to have to spend heavily on SGA, right? You're going to have to spend heavily on R&D. So, so this is something to aspire to in year three, year four, year five. Yeah, I mean, you can't, in year one, you've got no revenues, right? You're still developing the product. So, you know, you can't have margins and operating earnings until you get to a mature stage, right? So when you get here, 53% and 16%, are pretty good numbers. But we see a lot of pro formers in the TEDCO pitches where they're at 50% operating margins. Nobody makes 50%, right? So I'm not saying you have to know exactly what these numbers should be. <clears throat> but if an investor asks you to, you know, defend that number, it's, in my opinion, it's perfectly acceptable to say that's where the industry, the segment I am in, settles out at, you know, and here are the reference industry competitors <coughs> I've looked at. To me, that's acceptable. And uh, I want to stress in this room, you're hearing my opinion, right? And there's always other opinions out there. So go and ask somebody else, you know, don't, don't take all this as gospel.
anything to do with product development. So, are you ever improving your service? Well, I was going to say, if you, if you have to send someone for six months of training, would, would that just be, where would, what, where would, what would come from if you put the training expense to have them get a new certificate for the Well, um, it depends what that person's role is. And it, it doesn't really matter as long as you put it in there. What sort of business are you thinking of, may I ask? Uh, health concierge services. Health concierge service. So. I mean, I can think of some a related service we're going to do that would require traditional R&D. But for just the actual services, you're either hiring competent people or you're not. So the R&D costs are one of them. Yeah. Well, I'm just trying to think Yeah. And some, you know, some industries I mean, Apple's R&D is only 2.6%. Who would ever have thought of that? So GM's is 0% according to Yahoo Finance. And I suspect that's because they capitalized their R&D rather than expensing it. But that's getting into accounting rules, right? <laughs> Just capture it, right? So. Where we're at now is, whoops, we've got some additional lines, capital spending. So what is capital spending? Capital spending is money you must spend on buying, not renting, assets that you need to produce the product. Some of you may not need capital spending at all. But if you're going to be building automobiles, you spend a huge amount on capital. So when GM designs a new car, it costs $200 million to design the car, and then $800 million to build a factory to, be, to make the car. So that's what capital spending is. It's, it's the equipment you're going to need to buy to make the deliverable, delivered product or service. So some of you might need no capital spending. Some of you will need capital spending. If, you, if you're going to go into the food truck business, you need to buy a truck, right? A food truck. That, that's a capital expense. If you're producing software that you're delivering through the web on servers, if you're hosting your own delivery system, if you're buying a basement full of servers, that's capital spending. You have to have the servers in place before you can deliver the software. If you're renting servers from Amazon or somebody else, then the server costs will probably be in your cost of sales because you don't own them. So capital spending <coughs> is depreciated over time. Don't worry about the word depreciation. Don't even worry about capturing depreciation in your pro forma. It's not necessary. The investors only want to know how much cash you're going to need to buy that capital equipment. Depreciating it and accounting for it, forget it. Could also be buildings, vehicles, anything else you need. But here's the trap. Capital equipment needs to be purchased, installed, and turned up and running before you can make anything. So you get that $10 million order. If you weren't ready for it, you've got to go out and spend money on the capital equipment that you need to make the product before you can start building it, before you can ship it, before you can get revenue from it. So that's a trap a lot of start startups fall into. And if you're too lucky and you get a huge order on day one, you won't be able to even buy enough capital equipment and get production underway. Because nobody, nobody will give you anything on credit as a startup. Everybody that supplies you with anything, capital equipment, raw materials, anything, they want cash up front. They'll let you put it on a credit card, if your credit card's big enough, 
but nobody will give you anything on credit, like, like a line of credit from a bank. A bank won't give you a line of credit. So you've got to have enough money from your investors to pay for that capital equipment. Now, I've made an estimate that this company needs $3 million worth of capital equipment. I've said they need a million here to produce whatever they've got to ship in year two, and another two million to spend here to get them to year five. So from this now, we calculate how much cash you've got. You always have to have cash. You can't do anything without cash. You can't survive without cash. You don't get credit from suppliers. You've got to make payroll. You can't employ people without cash. You've got to have cash. We've had pro formas being shown where the person presenting it showed negative cash on their pro forma. There's no such thing as negative cash. For this purpose, from an accounting viewpoint, there is such a thing as negative cash. But for the purposes of this pro forma, negative cash doesn't exist. You've always got to have some money in the bank, right? So at the moment, we were 700,000 in the hole here. We are another million in the hole, so we're minus 1.7. So we have negative cash so far. But now, this is where you need to get so that you know how much money to ask for. So if I'm going to make this a business, the most I go in the hole is $5.6 million. So if I was going out to investors asking for money, I would ask, for six million dollars of investment. It's that easy. And again, at Tedco, we've had companies come in, and when they show the pro forma, it shows they need <coughs> six million dollars of investment. But then when we ask them how much they're trying to raise, they say 12 million dollars. So you need, it sh this shows you need six. Why are you asking for 12? Well, you know, we might need some extra money, so, you know, we thought we'd ask for 12. An investor gives you only what you need and hopes that you run out. Because when you run out, you have to go back and renegotiate the investment. And that's when they start to turn the screws on you, right? That's when they start to make life hard for you. So you've got to ask for what you really, truly think you need. You got a question? What about a runway? So if you, for example, are going for your seed, or your seed round of funding and you're trying to raise enough funding for 18 months, are you trying to ask, have this line up so that at year 1.5, the amount at year 1.5 is exactly equal so, so to that's a good, that's a good question, right? So to get this business off the ground and be self-sustaining, you need six. The investors want to know that. The next question they ask is, do you want all six, or do you want half of it? And so I'll come, I'll come to that and answer your question. It looks like you need a total of six. Do a monthly analysis. In this year, in this year, make sure that halfway through the year it, it wasn't going to drop to seven, and then at the end of the year you back up to six because you're making money that year. So double check by doing a quarterly analysis for that year or a monthly analysis for that year. You need at least two million in the first year, right? So to get through this year, you need at least two. You should have 18 months or two years runway. So th the term runway means how long is that money going to last you? So investors want you to have at least 18 months of runway after you get their money. Because they don't want you out on the road trying to raise money 
as soon as you've got their money. So, you know, it's, it's ridiculous trying to raise 500,000 and then three months later you're out begging for another 500,000, then another three months you're out looking for another 500,000. Go for whatever it takes to get you through at least 18 months or two years. You've got to buy yourself two years of runway if you can. You could go for two raises of three million each. And in this, in this I'm showing three million here and three million here. What the investors want to know is how much total money do you need before this business is self-sustaining and you don't need to go and get more investment. Then it's up to negotiation. <clears throat> if you're talking to a VC fund and the VCs have got the big money, they may offer you all six, but they'll only give it to you in what they call a two tranches. So a tranche is French for slice, right? So they, they call it a tranche. And they'll off, they might offer you $6 million in two tranches, meaning we'll give you $3 million now. And if you meet the project milestones you've told us you're going to meet by this year, three, then we'll give you the other $3 million. Another way to do this is you could have gone to an angel investor and asked for one and a half million here and then the angel would have been happy if you said you know I'm going to go out next year and get VC money and get five million from a VC. That may be an easier way to approach this but you can only, you can only assess that once you've got to this point and you've decided whether you're going to get early money from angels and later money from VCs it all depends how much you need in total. And angels are much easier to find and talk to than VCs. Yes? I'm curious about tranches. When you say that you can get six million in two tranches, does the three million coming in year three come at the same valuation of your company as when you had it in year one? If it, if it was negotiated that way, yes. If it was negotiated that way. Why does it make sense to do that then if your valuation is presumably higher? And so, like like I understand what the advantage is. So, the advantage is to them. The advantage is to the investor, not to you. Okay. Right. <clears throat> in fact, tranches hardly ever used to happen. Um, in, in the late 90s, um, when the internet bubble was about to burst, tranches didn't happen. VCs would hand out $100 million in one fell swoop and off you go to the races. And, and tranches started to creep in as the VCs realized that the bubble was never going to happen again. And they needed to be more cautious with their money and all kinds of tricks have crept into term sheets now. So if, before you get it, even get into this discussion, you should sit down and talk to an attorney that knows the current term sheet content because they've introduced all kinds of tricks in the term sheets that can wipe you out even if you're successful. Right? Yes? Well, so when it comes to uh oh, we have to I may have two separate like performers, one for VCs and one for angel investors. No, they would want to don't have two performers. <laughs> no, it'll it'll trip you up. You will soon find out when you start talking about your performer. You will soon find out if angels like it or if VCs like it, or if nobody likes it. But don't try and shop two different pro formers because they all talk to each other. And angels, especially here, um, you know, if you show a pro forma like this, an angel may see it and say, okay, well, I'm willing to put in a million here and get you started, 
and then I'll give you another million here. Or, but they talk to each other because angels talk to VCs. An angel will invest if they think there's a follow-on a follow VC to make you successful. Because an angel can't afford $6 million. So for example, I was in a startup and we had an angel investor who made his money in the mid-90s uh, from a startup he was a co-founder of. And, and his co-founder is now a, a VC at Novak Biddle, which is a local VC. So he took our pro forma to his buddy at Novak Biddle and said, I'm going to give them this much money to get started. Are you interested in being the follow-on VC that gives them the big money when they need it? So they trade information backwards and forwards. And you cannot keep secrets in this industry. We once presented to New Enterprise Associates. And the guy there said, we don't want this investment. But my buddy at Valhalla probably needs it. So we went to Valhalla. Turns out these two guys were roommates at college, right? So don't ever fall into the trap of telling two different stories you'll get caught out. So that's, how are we doing? I, okay, so that's essentially the full pro forma. But now the question is, so what? So how are you going to make, sorry, go on. Um, just two quick questions. One is, if you're actually starting a business that is not expected to make money, because it's going to be free at first until you reach a certain critical mass, and then you'll have advertisement or other revenue. How does your sales or any strategy change when you're not anticipating to make money? Um, are you breaking even or are you losing money? You're anticipating <coughs> to lose money because it's free until you reach a certain growth as far as customer and popularity, and then you anticipate making money. That's going to be a tough one for investors. Are you going to be losing a lot of money? Like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, think of just like a lot of technology companies where at first, like apps and stuff like that, where they're losing money at first because it's free, but once they have a certain amount of people interested, then they can get advertisement and other companies so, so they, So if it's an app type business, there's a lot of people willing to fund apps in California. I don't know about the environment here, but everything they invest in loses money up front. But the issue is, how are you going to make me rich? If, and, and the VC has got, a VC has got like a seven or eight year window. They've got to be out of your investment within seven years usually. So if they, if they put money in here and here, then it, by year seven, they've got to be out of that business and they've got to have made their 10 times return on investment. They aim to make a 10 times return on investment. So if they've given you 6 million and you've only got 3.5 million in the bank here, how are you going to give them $60 million back in year seven? You can't do it out of the bank. So you've either got to be bought by somebody or you've got to go IPO or you've got to have something that makes you worth a lot of money by year seven. So this would not be a good enough pro forma to attract a VC. But there are many things that attract VCs other than just the cash number. A lot of VCs have got multiple investments in multiple ideas. Your idea may be a complement to their idea. This happens in California all the time. You're developing something they don't tell you, but they've already got an investment in a company over here. And if you put this idea together with the other idea, it's worth a bundle, right? They'll never tell you that. So don't just try. Don't just try and make this number look massive because you think that's what they want to see. Because if you make this massive, and the operating man margin is 70%, you don't have any credibility. You've got to go for credibility first. 
and then find out what the attraction is to them. And that's the hard part. Right? Go ahead. In the example of an app, is cost of sale going to be almost zero? Yeah. It's almost zero, yeah. It's almost zero. So, if you put all the effort into your pro forma, then writing a business plan, writing a PowerPoint, writing any kind of document that they ask for should be easy because the business plan is essentially an explanation of your pro forma. If you go through the pro forma exercise, it'll make you think carefully about all those lines and so then you'll be able to write a document and someone will ask you for a full business plan that might be 30 40 pages long and they'll probably never read it unfortunately that's what this industry is like they may never read it you may have felt it's a waste of time but someone will scan it to see if you know the answers to some of these questions. They might just read a piece of it, where's your first sale going to come from? Yep, you didn't say top down, you said bottom up, etc., etc. And then the business plan goes in the drawer and nobody looks at it again. Unfortunately, that's how it works. But if they ask for it, you better be able to provide one, right? So how does this make them rich? It could be growth, it could be earnings, it could be the team. Quite often, they'll invest in you if they think the team is fabulous and the team is needed by one of their <coughs> other companies. There's all kinds of reasons they see value in your business and you'll never figure out the real answer. But that's the time is up. <coughs> and I'm glad to say my voice made it. Hope you understood. Yes. So I attended, I think, in December, the Venture Capital Forum here in D.C. There were like four or five top venture capitalists here. One thing that they mentioned, the difference between now and 2002, 2001, is that when they're looking at investments, they see companies that already have business models in place. They already have customers in place. So I'd imagine that a lot of these VCs are looking at performance that already have revenue being generated, whether they're starting from from zero. So can you talk about that in terms of competing if, you know, before you go out, you want to have, given this environment today where that's what you're competing with, you want to be able to generate some revenue first? So, <coughs> excuse me. So back in, back in the late 90s, I was general manager of a division of Nortels called Metro Optical. Metro Optical was the big business back then. And in the late 90s, on a monthly basis, I would get a call from a venture fund asking me to buy their startup. And to you, Steve, only $4 billion. We're asking Lucent for $7 billion, <clears throat> but to you, $4 billion. And I spent a lot of time looking <coughs> excuse me, at some of these startups, and it was paper. It was nothing. It was paper design, no product, no prototype, nothing working. And those were the <coughs> days of irrational exuberance, right? Since then, the bubble burst. All these young guns that worked for the VCs have, were fired. Um, and sense crept in. And caution, a huge amount of caution. And the VCs all retreated. And the VCs started to only invest working capital. So all that money you need after you get an order, all that money you need to uh, buy material, buy capital equipment, it's called working capital. So the VCs would wait till you had orders and you needed working capital. And then they'd come in and provide the working capital at, at a ridiculous um, cost to you. And slowly that's easing. Now, there are some VCs like Valhalla who now have a seed fund. And a seed fund, by definition, means you don't have orders, you don't have revenue yet. So it's gradually getting better. 
But some VCs have made a career out of doing um, the risk-free investments. And some of them have gone back to the more risky investments. I've kind of lost touch with the VC um, environment around here because most of my friends work for angels. And um, angels are really the seed funders now, right? But I don't know how it's going to change tomorrow. And I'm sure it's different on the West Coast to what it is here. Sorry, we're out of time. Sorry.